Uh, the topic for this morning's talk is, in the present moment, what does this mean? And you hear a lot of talk about present moment this, present moment that, being in the present moment. What does all of this mean? So hopefully this morning uh, I can uh, expand a little bit upon that. Of course, where I can, I like to inject a little bit of the Buddha's own words into the discussion because you can hear a lot of commentators talk about things and it's all very nice, but it's not quite the same as getting it from the source, right? Coming from the Buddha's own lips, as best as we can tell anyway. So, the topic in the present moment, what does this mean? And we'll start off with uh, a sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya. I like to call it the Bad Karate Sutta. You'll remember that. Probably won't remember Bada Karata. Remember bad karate, you'll get there eventually. So this is from the Majjhima Nikaya number 131. It's got nothing to do with Japanese martial arts. And it's called A Single Excellent Night. Okay? So we'll make a start on this one. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa which means homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully awakened one. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the blessed one was living at Sarvati in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, venerable sir, they replied. The blessed one said this, Monks, I shall teach you the summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the monks replied. The Buddha said this, Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes, for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state. Let him know that and be sure of it, invincibly unshakably. Today the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come. Who knows? There is no bargain with mortality. Keep him and his hordes away. But one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly, by day, by night, it is he, the peaceful sage, has said, who has had a single excellent night. How, bhikkhus, does one revive the past? One enters delight, thinking, I had such material form in the past. One nurtures delight, thinking, I had such feeling in the past. I had such perception in the past. I had such formations in the past. I had such consciousness in the past. And that is how one revives the past. And how, monks, does one revive the past? does not revive the past. One does not nurture delight there thinking, I had such material form in the past. One does not nurture delight there thinking, I had such feeling in the past. I had such perception in the past. I had such formations in the past. I had such consciousness in the past. That is how one does not revive the past. And how, monks, does one build up hope upon the future? One nurtures delight there, thinking, may I have such material form in the future? One nurtures delight there, thinking, may I have such feeling in the future? May I have such perception in the future? May I have such formations in the future? May I have such consciousness in the future? That is how one builds upon hope upon the future. And how, monks, does one not build up hope upon the future? One does not nurture delight there, thinking, may I have such material form in the future? One does not nurture delight there, thinking, may I have such feeling in the future? May I have such perception in the future? May I have such formations in the future? May I have such consciousness in the future? That is how one does not build up hope upon the future. And how, monks, is one vanquished in regard to presently arisen states? Here, monks, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones 
and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, regards material form as self, or self as possessed of material form, or material form as in self, or self as in material form. He regards feeling as self, perception as self, formations as self, consciousness as self, or self as possessed of consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That is how one is vanquished in regard to presently arisen states. And how, monks, is one invincible in regard to presently arisen states? Here, monks, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, does not regard material form as self or self as possessed of material form or material form as in self or self as in material form. He does not regard feeling as self, perception as self, formations as self, consciousness as self, or self as possessed of consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That is how one is invincible in regard to presently arisen states. Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state. Let him know that and be sure of it, invincibly, unshakably. Today, the effort must be made. Tomorrow, death may come. Who knows? No bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. But one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly, by day, by night, it is he, the peaceful sage has said, who has had a single excellent night. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Monks, I shall teach you the summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, as a part of this exercise, to help understand what does the present moment mean, I'll now encourage you all firstly to turn off your mobile phones if you've got them. Do, do, this is the right time to do this. Please turn your phones off. If you think you've turned it off, do it again. <laughs> You'd be amazed how many times I say this and a phone goes off after the instruction twice, or request I should say twice. Maybe English is not the first language. Fair enough. <laughs> but you may not want to come to an English-speaking Dhamma talk if that's the case. So, now having the prerequisite of having turned off your mobile phones. There you <laughs> This is one of those lectures, yes. <laughs> okay. So, as a part of understanding the present moment awareness, there's nothing like direct experience. So, I will now ask you all, if you haven't already, to close your eyes. There's nothing you have seen up here that you haven't seen before. We'll see likely again. So, just closing your eyes. And now, we're just going to wait. Something interesting will happen. So just closing your eyes.
Where now is your awareness? What are you aware of? You can open your eyes now if you wish. We can leave them closed if you want. After having just given a talk, the Buddha's speech here, from the Sutta, show of hands, how many people were thinking of the past? Don't be shy, there's no uh, death squad here that's going <laughs> to, it's not a crime to think of the past. Okay, and those of you who thought of the future, put your hands up. Okay, by, th by that, by those who have not put their hands up, which seems to be at least a third of you, you must have been in the present moment because there's no other time frame. You're either in the past or the future or the present, right? But if you're in the present, what is actually going on in your mind? What, are, what do you think constitutes the present moment? It's not being asleep. Being asleep doesn't mean that you're in the present moment. If you're thinking of the thoughts of the future, what are your plans? This is the, the future is about plans. The future is about gain. Those of you who are thinking of the past are thinking about loss or things that you don't like, you find irritating. You might hear, for example, when your eyes were shut just then, you might hear somebody scratching next to you, moving in their seat, coughing. You might hear a child talking or playing with toys. These are all natural things. But when you're reflecting upon that which you have heard, you're in the past. You're reflecting on a past action which resulted in sound, which is now something that you're contemplating. Although you may think that you're in the present, you're actually not in the present at all. You're going over historical events. Even after I click my finger, I've heard the sound, but if I start to reflect where did that sound come from, immediately I'm in the past. This is not present moment awareness. Similarly, I might think, oh, I can't wait for uh, that clicking noise. Bhante says there's a clicking noise which is to come. But the Bhante hasn't clicked his fingers yet. I wonder when he's going to click his fingers. I wonder how loud it's going to be. Is he going to click it more than once? This is being in the future. Again, not the present moment. Not reflecting on what is happening immediately. What experiences are coming to the sense faculties, the sense bases? Sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. And even for the Dhamma, in terms of the Buddha's teaching, there's a sixth sense. That is the mind. What does that mean? Well, anything like imagination, conceiving of things. Maybe you are building castles in the sky, designing them with your imagination. This is a part of your sixth sense base, your mind. When your dreams, when you have dreams during your sleep, part of your sixth sense. Your nose and your, your tongue is not likely to give you much feedback. Even when a house is burning and the smoke is filling the place, Usually smoke, the smell of smoke is not strong enough to get you out of sleep until it's too late, but that's usually because it's very hot. By that stage, breathing is very difficult. It's not the smell which will get you out. It's the fact that your lungs are coughing, right? They're struggling. That'll get you up. Very vital. Smelling is not so vital. Breathing is. So even here in these kinds of circumstances, the mind is still active. Dreaming is not present moment awareness. It's also having this little adventure. What's happening next in the dream? What's just happened? Reflecting upon if you've got people within your dream or animals, what are they doing? What are these people saying? What's their motivation? Even in a dream, it's not peaceful. It's still very active, but it's not in the present moment. You may have heard terms like bare awareness. Bare awareness is not possible until you're fully enlightened. Only the fully enlightened ones have bare awareness. It's impossible unless you have dropped greed, hatred and delusion completely. It's impossible for you to see something in the present as being undistorted. 
the presence of greed, hatred and delusion within one's mind naturally distorts that before you actually get to understand or have any interaction with it. It's already distorting. Just imagine that there are three lenses placed in front of your eyes. And if I was to look at this camera here, hello video world. So you've got the three lenses of greed, hatred and delusion. And I'm looking through these three lenses to see what I think is a camera, okay? But when I'm looking through this, it's distorting with greed. It's distorting with anger. It's distorting with delusion. Before I can even understand what is on the other end of it, already my vision is warped. It's twisted. It's not correct. It's not true. So I might come to the idea, this is a, a, a Lumix camera. But already that's distorted. On one level, yes. But on a deeper level, no, it's not a camera at all. Maybe on a deeper level, it's uh, rising and falling away of earth element, fire element, water element, air element. In other words, electrons, protons and neutrons, quarks, coming and going, coming and going. But I take it to be a form, I take it to be this is a camera. And worse, if, if, I, if I had paid for it, it's my camera. We inject the idea of a self possessing these four elements which keep changing because of the distortion of greed, hatred and delusion. If it was truly a present moment situation, all that is visible, or all that can be known, is a rising and passing away of things. That's it. In the present, right now, a rising and passing away. If you had a very powerful sight or vision, like electron microscope type of vision or sight, if you was to look at my hand right now, with that as opposed to with your natural eyes, you would th see things falling away from this hand right now. Skin cells breaking up, breaking apart. But if you look with your normal eyes, all you see is a stable, steady skin, continuous, with no breaks between any of those cells. But if you can look closer, you see that there are breaks between the cells. There are creases, wrinkles. Look even closer, you'll find flakes of skin coming off the hand, nearly on its way off. Kind of like dandruff, if you want to think of it like that. Dandruff flakes off and goes off your hair. But in a similar way, that's happening now. And it's happening like that for all of us. I think most of the dust in your house is actually dead skin cells. Did you know that? Disturbing, isn't it? You wipe your finger like that and you go, wow, where did that come from? <laughs> from your body or somebody else's body who's been in the house, wherever you're living. If we can see even more deeply than that, we understand it's just arising and passing away. When we see arising and passing away, we don't actually see a self. We don't see a person. We don't see my cat or my car. It is just coming and going of material form. That's it, in the present moment. If we go into the future, we go into the past. We've departed from that understanding in the present. We're looking to create an adventure. We're looking to create something I'm, I'm interested in or I am not interested in. Reflecting upon the past usually is about regret or not liking something. If you beat yourself up a lot, it's because you live in the past. Oh, I should have done this. I should have gone to that school. My parents didn't love me enough. Uh, I should have had that girlfriend or boyfriend. I should have went for this job instead of that job. Should have, should have, should have. Could have, would have, should have. This is the mantra of the loser. Okay? People who live in the past cannot move, in, cannot move anywhere in the present. They're stuck. Similarly, people who have got their heads in the clouds, thinking about the future. Oh, I'd like to do this. I, I want to do that. Not should I, because that's past tense. I want to. I should do this. You know, I could do this. Could. The opposite of should. Could. I could do this. Well, what's stopping you? Well, stopping you is because you're not in the present. Dreaming only goes so far. Being a visionary only goes so far. 
What's the vision without the application of work in the present? What is it worth? I can say I want to set up the biggest internet in the world, which, which is free for everybody to use, unlimited access, no cost. That's a great vision. Are you going to do anything about it? No, no. Just thinking about it, oh, that's nice. <laughs> you keep thinking about that, I've got to go to work. <sighs> thinking about things doesn't get the bills paid. All right? That's why monks don't handle money. <laughs> what do we do? We try as best as we can to actually do nothing. And now that sounds easy. I can do nothing all the time. Actually, I want to my boss to allow me to do nothing at work. But it doesn't work like that. To actually do nothing requires supreme effort. Supreme effort. Because sitting there daydreaming is doing something. Sitting there on the beach looking for a tan is doing something. Then having to move out because it's too hot, you're doing something. You're creating things. You're creating potentials for your future or trying to avoid something which is unpleasant right now. You only want to get the unpleasant feeling away. But that's with the ideal of a future state which is yet to arise. Do you understand at that point, you're still not in the present. Avoiding the pain of something is not present moment awareness. You've already moved beyond the recognition that there is pain. Yes, that's in the present. Just the recognition, nothing more than that. As soon as you start to create a story about that pain, this has moved beyond the present moment awareness. You've now gone into a future requirement. I don't like the feeling right now. In the past, I've had pleasant feelings. I don't like the unpleasant feeling which is cognizant, which I'm cognizant of, which I'm aware of right now. Therefore, I need to change something in order to, arri to arrive at a pleasant feeling. You're going into the future to try and pull something into the present. You're not actually in the present anymore. When you're sitting there during the little three minutes of silence, where was the mind gravitating towards? Just understanding what's happening in the here and the now? Was it pushing out to the future? I wonder what's for lunch. I wonder how long I have to sit here listening to this. I wonder how long this guy is going to cough next to me. Or is he going to cough all day? Future. Wanting to change the present because you're not happy. The search will come because you are not satisfied with the present moment. There will be a search or there will be confusion. I'll read out a section here where the Buddha talks about this. It's actually, I saw this a few uh, weeks ago. They come to mind this morning as I'm thinking about the topic. So I've got that here actually. No moment like the present, right? Why delay it? It may never come. <laughs> All right. And what is the result of suffering? So this is the Buddha's words. And what is the result of suffering? Here, someone overcome by suffering with a mind obsessed by it Sorrows, languishes and laments, he weeps, beating his breast and becomes confused. Or else, overcome by suffering, with a mind obsessed by it, he embarks upon a search outside, saying, Who knows one or two words for putting an end to this suffering? Suffering, I say, results either in confusion or in a search. This is called the result of suffering. That's from the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Sixes, Sutta number 63. Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Suffering embarks upon either the search or has confusion. I take your presence here today to be one of those who are on a search. Whereas you wouldn't be here. You're looking for a way out of suffering or dissatisfaction. Dukkha can be interpreted in different ways, but dissatisfaction is probably better. Well, it's just not satisfactory. I'm not satisfied with how this is, this being life, this being experiences, whatever they are for you. It's not satisfactory. Something needs to change. Okay, you can be aware of this. So you undertake a search. Some of us will go to other religions for this search, other philosophies for this search, Buddhism being among one of many. 
avenues that we explore. Some of us start in one religion, end up in another. Some of us start with no religion and end up in a religion. Some of us start with a religion and end up in no religion or philosophy. Some of us start with nothing and end with nothing. I think I've covered it all now. <laughs> it doesn't really matter where you start. What really matters is the process you undertake as you go along. Some people are outcome driven. So you could say Nibbana or bust. It sounds great. It's the kind of bumper sticker you want as a Buddhist. Nibbana or bust. <laughs> One might change it around to say you're bust if you try to get to Nibbana. <laughs> it's, not, it's no longer a search then. It becomes an obsession. A one-track a one mind. Right? One can say Nibbana is the, is the goal. Okay, fair enough. But with life, a lot of things is not about uh, what you're doing. It's about how you're doing it. What kind of process? You could say Nibbana at best, but you look behind you and there's just a trail of destruction. People who you've irritated along your holy path. You've shoved them off the holy path with your elbows and you barge them over because they're in your, your road. Whose road? Your road. And this is the teaching of non-self, right? <coughs> Whose road? <laughs> my road. This is my path to Nibbana. So when we start to think this way, we're able to mitigate other people out of our lives, push them out. But this is not necessarily the right process. The three lenses, again, are kicking in. A greed, hatred and delusion. You're seeing that this one fixated kind of opinion about, ah, oh, this is Nibbana for me. Again, not in the present moment, making stories again, going off in other directions. Not understanding what's happening now. If you are grounded in the present, that is right now, how do you think it's possible to get into an argument with someone? What do you think? Possible or impossible? If you are grounded in the present. Yeah, not too sure, are we, huh? <laughs> Impossible. Oh, do you agree with that? I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, if you're in the present, all you're, all you're listening to is just sound coming and going. You don't, and all you're hearing is... Mm -hmm. without the irritating connotation. It doesn't have a connotation. The connotation is coming after the sound. It's just sound. It's one of the ways I teach meditation is to start off. The preliminary step is just to listen to sound coming and going. Without the judgment. Don't try to work out, is that a truck? Is that a Mack truck? If it's a truck, is it Volvo or Mack? Has it got eight wheels? Has it got 16 wheels? What kind of, what? Already you've gone off on a little story. It's your story. It's not everybody else's story. That's your story. Into the future. Gone off. Away from the present. But if you're in the present, all you hear is of the engine. That's it. As it's coming and going. You don't have any judgments about that. You don't have any opinions about that. You're not trying to work stuff out. Working stuff out is not the present moment. All that you can find in the present is peace. All that you will find in the future and the past is disturbance confusion, right? With suffering as a base, which is life, as the Buddha says, birth is suffering, aging is suffering, and dying is suffering. I think it covers everything. Sickness is suffering. So with that as a base, because all of us are in that situation of birth, death, aging, and illness, with that as a base, suffering arises. With suffering as condition, then there's two options. It's either you search for a solution to that or you're confused. And what is confusion here? We gravitate towards those things which are not connected with Nibbana, not connected with release, release from greed, hatred and delusion. We will go to the movies, we will listen to our music, we will go to art galleries, we will build things, architecture. We will read the newspaper we will look at the stories in those newspapers and we get caught up with those stories. This is my reality. 
a lot of the newspapers, of course, is about the past. It's not about the future. And even when they report about what might come in the future, that's not certain either. But we're interested in those things which we think are so close to our life. If I'm not aware of this terrorism, I could die. You could. But what does your real world experience tell you? How many of you have family members who know, or friends who know, a terrorist? You don't have to put your hand up. <laughs> ASIO spies are here watching. <laughs> right, okay, we've got this one here. We'll follow that one up. <laughs> we'll round you up later. Police are outside. <laughs> I, I would guess most of you don't know anyone who knows even a terrorist. And we're talking about, in a room of this size with this many people, we're talking about thousands of people in this loop. Don't know a terrorist, let alone has suffered directly from it. And yet we're to believe this is the worst thing in the world. We kind of get picky about what we like and don't like, or what we think is legal and not legal, right? Right? But we have, to like, we have to watch the present. If we're staying in the future or in the past, we get caught up with these stories and then we can get angry. But if you're in the present, you haven't got the ability to become angry. You just see sound arising and pass away. If you can feel within yourself anger arising, snap out of it. You're getting caught up in a story of the future or the past, which is uncertain. The future, the future is definitely uncertain. The past is a bad memory. We, we usually do not remember the past accurately, 100%. We don't. How many times have you caught yourself thinking of something in the past? Oh, it's definitely like this. And then other people said, no, it wasn't. You didn't say that. Oh, here, look, here's the court trans uh, transcript. You didn't say anything like that. Here's the video. You watch it. Oh, I did say that. I didn't say that. Our memory is not, it's, it's not accurate. But yet we will get caught up in that. I said, no, you didn't. Yes, you did. And then we're off. Discussing something which was illusory, the past, saying it's definitely so. Making, prepared to go to war with another person over this. Prepared to struggle and fight. For what purpose? Where is peace in this equation? If we bring ourselves back to the now, there can be peace there not getting caught up in stories of the future or the past. So many of us limit our potential because we don't think we can achieve something in the future. Because we're actually not grounded in the present. I would love a beautiful garden. I think about all the flowers that I could have, the, the bush, the trees. I think about that future, but then I come back and I think of the past. Oh, I've been hopeless at planting in the past. I wouldn't know how to, how to look after the flowers. Maybe it'll get cold and they'll die. That's going back into the future again, right? You see how we bounce from future to the past? When are we coming back to the present? If we come back to the present, we pick up the spade and we go out into the garden. We do. The difference between a hero and a loser, the hero does stuff in the present. The loser thinks about the future or the past. Right? Yes, you need to do some planning. Okay? You don't just walk into the garden with a spade and just dig randomly. That would be a bit of a disaster. Oh, look, you've just gone through the hose. <laughs> you've gone through the electrical pipes or whatever. Right? So yes, we do a bit of planning, but planning has to come into action. Right? Right action. Right view, right thought, right livelihood. This is active stuff, not passive stuff. In the Noble Eightfold Path, right livelihood means you're doing something the right way, not thinking about something. Thinking is left at the first place. Right view, okay? From that, all things will flow. If your thinking is aligned with right view, your actions of body and speech will be in the same alignment. No problem. At the beginning, yes, you have a bit of planning. I have to plan to get on a plane, it's true. I have to book a ticket, know the time and the date, arrive at the airport in time, because planes don't work on monastic time. Oh, Venerable, it's lovely that you're in the present moment. The plane left three days ago. 
What do you mean? <laughs> I'm at one with the cosmos. Well, yes, that might be so, but the plane did leave. <laughs> so we have to be grounded, all right? We have to be grounded. Yes, you make your plans. You don't have the expectation of it to happen, though. That's just being crazy because that means you have to know everything. You have to know the future, what's going to happen, the truck that's going to block the intersection, which is going to delay you by 20 minutes, which means you miss your plane. If you don't know all that detail, of course, you cannot, you cannot predict the future 100%. Of course, plans are subject to fail. Best laid plans. Doesn't take much. A couple of ducks walk across the road. Somebody stops. Then there's a multi-car crash. You're not going anywhere for the next half an hour, right? But you had your plans, okay? Well, yeah, make it, but don't attach to the outcome of your planning and thinking and scenario making. How often we think about the future and it doesn't come true the way we think it would come true. This is a hard lesson for us to learn. It's very hard for us to come back to the now. If I come back to the now, I'm surrounded by wonderful people around me. Right now, in this hall, I reflect in this way, I'm surrounded by wonderful people all seeking in some way to remove suffering from their lives. Not through aversion, but through wisdom. Looking at the causes, not the symptoms. I think I've got a lot of good friends around me right now. People of like mind. This is in the present moment. But I don't dwell on that thought, then I'm in the past again. It's so easy to get caught in the trap. I have the reflection how wonderful it is to be surrounded by people like this. But I don't hold on to that. I keep moving with the present. The present is always like this. And my attention is always like this. Tracking like this. Not like this. The present moment has moved forward. I'm stuck in the past. When I'm holding on to something, I'm stuck in the past. But if I'm with the present, my attention is here in the now and it's moving forward like this, always in the present. Not dreaming. Dreaming is when you're going to the, the present is here and I'm off in fantasy land, going forward. Don't fast forward. Don't rewind. Stay with the play button. Right? If you're watching a movie, you're watching the images as they're flashing up. Flick, flick, flick. It's, mul it's not a... It's not a continuous kind of, it's a stream of individual images that you're seeing. Shot frame by frame, played so quickly to give you the illusion of movement, but we're actually staying with the frame in the present, this frame now, it's gone. This frame now, it's gone. This frame now, it's gone. I'm aware of each frame as it's coming, not dropping frames, not rewinding and going back, not fast forwarding trying to look for the future event. Imagine if the movie could change the outcome of that movie. Just watching a normal movie, imagine if there's multiple outcomes, but because you fast forward, you have really no idea which outcome will come up. That's like real life. There are so many frames that can change when you fast forward. And not due to you, due to others. Other people got their own plans, even things outside of other people's hands. Change of weather, nothing to do with other people. Yet it affects how people do things. Instead of Joe being outside, Joe went inside. It's too cold outside. I was waiting for you, Joe. You said you'd be on the pavement. Five past eight, I was going to pick you up. You weren't there. Now I'm late. Well, it's not because of Joe, really. It's the weather changed. Joe didn't want to get sick. Joe went inside. <laughs> Simple things like this. If we project into the future or look back into the past, I said five past eight, you weren't there, going back to the past again. We project into the future when we make the plan, being on the curb at five past eight. Future and past, where is the present? The Buddha says, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, complaining about the past shows a lack of wisdom. Because you can't change it. Why dwell on it? Well, I remember 10 years ago you said da 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 and you did this, you didn't take that out. And now what? So what? Now what? <laughs> but we keep playing these tapes over and over, these records over and over. Because we haven't let, we didn't really let go of it. 
We say we let go of things from the past, but we actually haven't let go of it at all. We keep replaying those scenarios. Why? Because it makes you think, I am. It reaffirms a sense of identity for you. And this is why you do it. It's also why I do it. <laughs> Creates this sense of identity. If there was nothing in the past, then what, is, what are you? If there's nothing in the future, then what are you? It starts to get scary, doesn't it, when you think this way? You start to think borderline non-self. Ooh, watch out. There's nothing there. But it, that's what this whole thing is about anyway, really, understanding that there isn't anything there that had that experience in the past. There isn't anything there that's going to experience this thing in the future. Until you come to that realisation, you will keep playing stories from the past and creating these castles in the sky of the future. And that's not the now. That's not in the present moment. So, I'll leave that as a reflection for you today. This is a talk on the present moment. What is this? It's not that. <laughs> I open up for any questions that you might have on this topic. There is no conflict with what I have said to what you have said. <laughs> you learn from the past and it becomes your current programming. It's part of your current... When you learn from the past, it becomes part of your current present moment awareness programming. True. Right? So it's not like you've forgotten. Learn the lesson, but you don't keep playing the lesson over and over and over. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So you learn from it, yes, but it's now part of your, your current programming and it's moving with the present. Yeah. That, that wisdom is still with, with you at, at this point in time. Okay? But yes, you don't go back, oh, I remember when I learned that lesson for, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so yes, no, no conflict, I don't think, with what you're saying and, yeah, what's been presented here so far, yeah. Do we have a, sorry, do we have a microphone to go around? Um, no? Ah, yes, good. We do have a microphone. It's good for people to be able to hear because um, also for the recording side of things, for people on YouTube to see how um, you really are. <laughs> with your questions. All right, microphone's on its way. <coughs> with those microphones, it's best to leave it on your chin. Okay. Pretend. Oh, no. I mean, I just, I just, I just, I just make it a sound. The reason I pull up the word pretend is it, underneath that is a motivation already. Pretend means I don't really want to listen to you. So it's actually not listening to the sound at that stage. It's already gone on to a future ideal. <laughs> Oh, I think it's a pleasant moment. I don't want to talk about the past. <laughs> and then 
Yeah, but the moment they bring that thing up in the present moment becomes a pre present moment issue. Yes. Yeah, as soon as. No, talking about it doesn't have to involve dwelling in the past. It's dwelling about in the present, right now. For example, if I set fire to this bowl and I look, there's a fire. Well, there's a fire now. I don't have to go to the past. The only time I reflect on the past is what solves the fire problem? An extinguisher, water. So I've learned that lesson, and this is where it touches on the first question. I have brought the wisdom from what fire doesn't like is water. That's something I learned in the past. I'm not dwelling there though, referencing that wisdom which is in the current, the moment, right now. Referencing that wisdom, having learnt from the past, the wisdom currently has that understanding, water negates fire. In the present I see the fire, I get the water and I put it out. I fix the problem. In the same way with relationships, if there's a problem and somebody says to you, look, I, this is, I'm having a difficulty with you because of this and this, and you, I mean just to sit there and to say, oh you're so negative, you're just living in the past. Well, maybe they they keep going back to the past, but the present moment issue is the problem that they're facing, and that's what is that's what requires the assistance in the now, in the present. So you're not living in the past all the time. That person might be dwelling a lot about the past, but they're bringing the issue to you in the now. It's becoming a problem now. How do you deal with it? That's a now thing, not a past thing, right? So you can refer, you reference the past, but you don't live there. Don't keep going on about it. You only reference the past from those lessons that we've learned. That's now part of our current wisdom. Okay, so if you learn it there and then you tell them that in the future, I shouldn't do this or I should do this. Isn't that like living in the future again? If it happens in the future? If you're trying to learn from it. Yeah. If you do a lot of I shalls, yes. But when the moment arises in the future, if the moment arises in the future, big if, remember the future being uncertain. But if it was to arise again, then you know the strategy to deal with it and you take care of it at that point in time. Again, don't live in the future. Don't create scenarios. What if, what if they do this? What if they cheat again? What if they cheat again? What if they cheat again? You're just living in a, a non-reality. You're just creating this scheme. And often what we think about actually becomes manifest. If I think my partner's cheating on me, my partner's cheating on me, we keep thinking that our interaction in the present will give them that inclination that they don't trust me, then they might go and cheat. Why? Simply because we think it might happen in the future. We keep thinking that we actually create the conditions for them to want to go and do it. Oh, you don't trust me. They keep saying this, they don't trust me. They don't trust me. Oh, fine, okay, I'll prove it. Whereas if we had trust in the first place, it's, that doesn't mean to say we go around blind or deaf. I'm not saying that. But just to not to create these, these intentions, yeah. Not to create these thoughts and let them take hold so much so that you'd start to distrust those people that you love. You create that new future. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, the future takes care of itself. If you take care of the present, your future can't be any better than what it can be. If you take care of the present, your history will be the best history possible. Don't worry about the future too much. Be wise by understanding what you've learnt from the past part, becomes a part of the wisdom chest. And in the present moment, when it's required, you reach into that, you pull out the appropriate wisdom to deal with the situation at hand. Don't have to live in the past or the future. Okay, there's a question down here. Somebody happy to bring the microphone down? Yeah, that's it. Very good. Okay. <coughs> I was just trying to expand on the third question, Doctor. Uh, I think there's a difference between making the determination now to deal with the future and rehearsing how to deal with the issue in the future. Mm. Rehearsing it is like Hmm. Well, that's an example of this is for the talk this morning. <laughs> it was quite funny, actually. Even during that two-minute 
three minute meditation period, I got you to close your eyes. Now, you'll notice that I actually didn't ask you to do anything apart from close your eyes and that was quite important. Otherwise, I'd be directing your intention in a certain way. I just said close your eyes. I never said meditate. I never said anything apart from that. Just to close your eyes. And you came up with your own stories of the past or the future. All right, I didn't do anything there. But when, when I shut my eyes, I started to think about, now, what topics do I need to cover in this talk? <laughs> Boom, straight to the future, right? You know, I'm, I'm in the hot seat. I, um, I come up with this talk this morning. I found a sutta this morning, uh, cleaned up my room so the school kids have got a, a place to do their class and whatnot. So then I go, okay, what's the, what am I going to cover next? And I thought, Venerable, you're just getting sucked into the very thing that you're talking about. <laughs> you're getting dragged into the story and narrative of what am I going to do? What am I going to do next? So I caught myself doing the very thing that I'm telling you not to do. Right? But then it's hard for me because I'm also trying to run a session. <laughs> but even so, you have to be catching yourself. Even if you're doing this, it's not an excuse. Right? So, yes, I have set the intention this morning to talk about this topic. Um, I, but I have no idea really of what the direction will be exactly. So the intention was there to have a talk on this topic. But if I said to you I have everything um, pre-planned and programmed, that would also be false. I'm leaving a lot of room. I know that I looked for a, a teaching of the Buddha to back up the topic. But outside of that, just a few, these are my notes there. That's it. A few words. Um, one of them I read out was a paragraph from the text, so very little. So I'm trying, trying not to pre-program the future too much. Even the order in which I thought this morning, should I do the meditation side thing first, the two minutes of silence first? Should I do it in the middle? And the way it went, it didn't go the way that I thought anyway. So I went, well, I just got to roll with it. Got to roll with it. That's being in the present. But yes, we do need to have some planning for things to take place. You, you try and build a building without planning, it would just be a complete mess. The carpet layers turn up and you say, well, we haven't even put the walls up. <laughs> the concrete's not poured. You've got to just put the carpet on the dirt. This is crazy. You cut, yes, so we do need to have some plans, but you don't attach to the outcome. You don't attach to the timeline. Planes will be delayed. Buses are delayed. Friends are delayed. Marriages are delayed. Your jobs are delayed for things out of your control, due to things out of your control. If you hold on to that, it'll burn you. You can have the intention, Nibbana. You don't have to add the or bust part, okay? <laughs> the or bust is giving you the pressure, the unreasonable pressure, making demands of the, of the future that the present cannot supply and fulfill. That's the or bust part. Nibbana is fine as long as you don't put a timeline to it. If you set your intention in that direction, it's still fine as long as you don't give it too many conditions. The moment we apply conditions, we create an unreal and a harsh reality for ourselves, which is hard to fulfill. I would say maybe even impossible to fulfill because we can't understand all the variables which are going on in the background. We don't know. Anything can happen in any day and it throws us off balance. Small thing, a really small thing. Two sugars or one in my coffee can ruin my day <laughs> if I'm not wise, okay? Yeah. Uh, one of the seven factors of enlightenment is uh, wise reflection. Uh, can you elaborate uh, on that, on the basis of your context of your recent talk? Okay, wise reflection, enlightenment yeah. factor. Mm. So when we're looking at thinking of the future and thinking of the past, we can't change those things. It's unwise to invest so much time in things that you actually can't do anything about. You can do something about the present, right? You can do something in the now. I can choose now to either get up and go and have some lunch or to continue speaking with you or to answer questions. Those are choices. So right now, I choose to be here to answer questions. I think it's helpful for people to ask questions about things which are being presented to clarify understanding. And if you're not clarifying your understanding, I clarify my own. <laughs> it's a win for me. If it's not for you, that's all right. Well, that's your issue for me. I'm going to make it a win for me in the now, here, now. 
I can benefit from this now. Wisely reflecting, I understand in this way. The work for enlightenment takes place now, not tomorrow. The Buddha also gives us a meditation on death for this very reason. Death is coming. And he mentions this in the sutta. Death is coming. There's no way that you can keep death away. There's no negotiation with death. Oh, I'm not feeling up to death right now. Can you come back tomorrow? I'm just, just, I don't want to die now. Um, death will come, <laughs> whether you like it or not. But how do you reflect upon that? When we're more in the present moment, we're actually wisely reflecting. When we're going off to la-la, dreamland, and we're not wisely reflecting. We take the present for granted. Most of us will take the present moment for granted. When you're looking for entertainment, distraction, reading a novel, this is taking the present for granted. You think you have another second ahead of you in which to finish that chapter, in which to watch the next episode, in which to go to the theme park, another trip on the ride. There are people who don't have a next chapter. They don't even have a next sentence or a next word. It finishes on the spot like that and they don't expect it, and they're not using their time wisely. The Buddha says this, one of the ten reflections for those who are newly ordained. This is good for you too, Venerable. The days and nights are relentlessly passing me by. How well am I using my time? It's not about the past, it's about the now. You can't change the past. How well are you using your time now? So right now you're here listening to some talk on Dhamma. This is part of wise reflection. A enlightenment factor is actually hearing the Dhamma. You have to hear it and then understand it and practice it. So this is wise reflection. Another question. Can we have the microphone? Does that answer all? Oh. Yes. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> reflection really is a present moment practice mm. where um, past experience might be brought forward into the present moment to be seen and understood in a uh, Dharma way. Uh, I think so. I think wise reflection is very, very important. Um, and uh, yes, that I, I kind of understand it as a present moment. It's not yes. obsessing with the past. Mm. It's not living in the past. Mm. But it's perhaps been a special experience mm. that needs to be understood. Because in actual fact, in reality, is you can't let go of a very complex past experience without really understanding it. Because it will just simply keep recurring. Yep. And it can be a very long, arduous <laughs> process. That's all I wanted to say. Yes, and that's that when I talk about the war chest, so to speak, of wisdom... It comes from all those previous battles. Yes. And you pick into that when you need it in the present moment. But you don't obsess about what the chest looks like or what the medallions in it look like. You take out what you need when you need it and use it as such. Don't keep replaying the stories over and over. Once you've learnt the lesson, there's no need to read the book a second time. Learning, Learning can only come from experience. Yep. Yeah. Is there another question? Yes. Wall, you know, like why aren't you responding um, to what this, you know, 
young with that, or, or even if you were at work and the manager was, was telling you, oh, I need you to get this done today, and you can go, and he's asking you a question, and you're thinking, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. <laughs> 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 it doesn't really make sense that way. Um, but then, a couple of lines of reflection, and this is where I would like um, for the input to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, as the questions went on, it, just, it, felt, it was actually interesting, as questions I felt was a book in itself. Um, but then, yeah, so I've worked out that it almost feels like we all have to be very good multitaskers, where in each present moment, despite how short you know, they are, um, we are receive, receiving, so sound, uh, pictures, whatever, we're receiving um, stimuli into our senses, but it's almost like in that same instant, we have to be wisely reflecting on each and every um, stimuli as well, and so there's a, there's a nimbleness to it, uh, where you know we, we have to be quite deft and, and, and skilled in um, processing all that quickly, instantaneously, and um, you know sort of um, building it into a programming right away as well, so that we can have that in our storehouse for future wise um, responses. <laughs> I don't know, so it, it, it was just um, all coming together in my head, I was like, oh maybe I'm just making a story of my own, so um, anyways, that's what I wanted to say as well. How long did that take to create? <laughs> <laughs> You were in the present when you were thinking about that? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. My question to you is why? Why, why, look, why look to these things? Why are you doing what you're doing? What was the purpose behind it? Not so much the question you just asked, but why mother? Why employee? You know, why a husband? Why these things? Are we setting up ourselves challenges that we don't need to undertake? And why are we taking those challenges up? Go back to the source. Because if you read in the Metta Sutta, there's a line in here, unburdened with duties. You say, it's hard with all these duties. The Buddha doesn't disagree with you. To be unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways. When we pick things up, we have to carry it around. And that's fatiguing. When we look at the eight precepts, which is practiced for lay people, there's no entertainment, there's no perfumes, jewelry, adornments. Why? Why? Because there's a picking up there. There's a getting involved with things there. That's not about the present moment. No, you can't walk around like a zombie, right? Well, however, to, you have to contrast that Back to the time of the Buddha, the Buddha is actually suggesting seclusion. Why seclusion? It's hard to have a conversation with yourself. Well, not a satisfying one anyway. <laughs> okay? When you mix around with other people, you're getting involved in their adventures. Then it becomes your adventure. Then you're off in future land and past land again. It's up to you. Nobody is forcing you to do what you're doing. Not, at least not in this country, anyway. Right? There's no gun to your head, is there? So then why? why? Why pick up? This is the question you need to answer. If you don't pick things up, you'll be born in the present moment. It doesn't matter where you are. But I don't go to the movies for peace. The idea of going to the movie, I'm going to test myself. Or do you just want to watch the show? <laughs> Let's be honest with ourselves, right? There's no point. You don't see monks going to movies to test their resolve. I'm testing my equilibrium and equanimity. Look, and there's an explosion. There's dismemberment. I am not affected either way. I am not in the past. I am not in the future. I don't care how this movie ends. Well, if you don't care, why are you there? Why are you there? You know you're getting somewhere when you can pull out of a movie halfway through and not care about the outcome. Mm, I don't know if he's going to live or die. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, my dad was really good with that. Oh, time to go to bed. It's not finished yet. Yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> he just goes. Like, why watch the movie if you're not going to finish the movie? Why? It's like starting, you know, you've got to pour some concrete. You add the sand, you add the water. You don't bother to put the cement in. No, it couldn't be, no. There's no what's the point? It's not concrete anymore. Why start a book and, you fin and you're not going to finish it? 
Why get involved in the first place? That's the question we have to ask. That's the trick. And we gloss over that real quickly. Real quickly. But that's the heart of the practice. <laughs> Why get involved? And that applies to everything. Relationships, career, kids, everything. Why get involved? Why do I get involved in doing this or saying that, going here or going there? When you can answer that question honestly for yourself, you're starting to practice. It brings it back to the heart. Does it help to answer your question?